The Egyptian arch ambush took place uh, just after midnight, the 12th of December, 1920. It was really a backup to a major operation taking place on an attack on the Kamala Barracks led by Frank Aiken, Jack McElhaw and others. On the night, the conditions were very uh, absolute Arctic conditions, freezing cold. A volunteer present then, Eddie Fullerton, Oglock Eddie Fullerton, said that the weapons to be used were all dumped in down round Bourne in the Corrigs and were given to Peter Barry and, and, and others. Unfortunately, something happened in, t in the town and there was a lot of roadblocks and they were unable to get most of the weapons up to the Egyptian arch on time. Eddie Fullerton, Oglock Eddie Fullerton said that he was contacted by John Francis O'Hare and told to report up to the Egyptian arch at 8 o'clock that night, the 12th of December, 1920. When he arrived, he said he met Jeff O'Hare, John Quinn, Charlie Grant, Seamus Lang from Dundalk, Bob Savage, Peter Shields, Willie Canning from Up Round Derry, Jack Delaney, Pat Lavery and Andy O'Hare. They waited and what the, they surmised was that once the attack on Camla Barracks took place, reinforcements would be sent out from Newry Barracks coming up the main road. As stated, Conditions that night were atrocious, heavy rain, frost and snow. Men were lying there freezing. Unfortunately, because the weapons didn't arrive, most of the volunteers were sent home and there was just this handful of volunteers left on the arch itself. Uh, when the shooting started, they heard the tenders coming up the road. Shooting started in Kamla, they could hear. The tenders with Black and Tans and RAC came up the road. Oglock Eddie Fullerton said that he witnessed uh, Willie Canning uh, taking a grenade out and pulling the pin. Unfortunately, this exploded and Willie Canning was killed outright. Another two volunteers were badly wounded, Peter Shields and John Francis O'Hare. The tenders hearing the explosion pulled in and opened up heavy fire from heavy machine guns on the, the Egyptian arch itself. The, the volunteers were then told by, I think, John Francis Quinn to abort the mission, that they were too, too outnumbered. They were able, the volunteers were able to carry Peter Shields, who was very badly wounded. They carried him away from the, the, the ambush site and were able to make their way as far as O'Meath. Unfortunately, John Francis O'Hare remained there badly wounded and unable to, to make his way to safety. In the meanwhile, Eddie Fullerton said that two of his sisters who had been members of Coming the Mon were also, some of them were also present uh, at, the, at the bottom of the arch waiting to give cover or forced aid. He said in, in his memoirs that the Coming the Mon girls, including his sister, were under the command of Mary Boyd and Susan Lavery. And they were at the, at the, at the few yards or hundred yards or so from the bridge waiting to help out in any way they could. Um, Peter Shields was badly wounded and taken as far as O'Meath and unfortunately then whatever first aid was given to him he unfortunately then died on Christmas Day 1920. He was then buried secretly by the volunteers somewhere in the O'Meath area. Um, meanwhile uh, out in Camla the attack on Kamla had started in, in earnest. The attack on Kamla Barracks took place on the 12th of December 1920. This is a detailed account from Captain Jack McElhaw of the Kamla Company of the IRA who was there on the night. The attack on Kamla Barracks. Preparations were made in the autumn of 1920 for an attack on Kamla Barracks. This barracks was one of the strongholds of the RIC in South Armagh and was fortified with sandbags and barbed wire entanglements. The plan of attack was to pump into the barracks a mixture of petrol and paraffin oil 
using a force pump and a garden hose, and by this means to burn out the barracks. Frank Aiken was in charge and took personal control of what was considered as the most dangerous part of the operation. This was to insert the tube conveying the mixture of petrol and paraffin into an upstairs window of the barracks. This tube was gun barrel tubing and was about 10 feet in length and with a few feet of the same tubing fitted at right angles at one of the 10 feet tube. The other tube, the other end of the tube was connected to the garden hose which was about 50 yards long and reached to a barrel placed in the field just outside the barracks garden at the rear of the building. The barrel contained 40 gallons of the inflammatory mixture and a force pump was available to pump the mixture. Directly in front of the barracks, on the opposite side of the road, three small houses were taken possession of and the upstairs windows used as positions for riflemen. On the southern side of the barracks, a number of men took up position along the side of the barracks and behind the cover of a low wall some 10 to 12 feet from the side of the barracks. From this position, hand grenades and rifle fire was directed from close range on the barracks window. Frank Aiken, myself and Tommy O'Neill took up position and got the garden hose and metal tubing from the barrel at the end to the side of the barrack. Jack Dorn and Paddy Henry took charge of the pumping. Before attempting to insert the tube into the barracks window we had to light the tow and the lighting of the tow was a signal to the men in charge of the force pump to commence pumping. When Frank Aiken failed in his first attempt to put the tubing into the small opening which was left in the sandbagged and steel shuttered window, I had to assist him by standing back from him and seeing where the window was and directing him. The barge windows were about 14 feet from the ground. The night was pitch dark, extremely cold, with showers of sleet and snow. As soon as the garrison realised the attack was on, a vigorous attack was made on the barracks from the houses in the front and from the men on the south side of the building. The volume of firing from the barracks and the barracks itself was deepening. The police used hand grenades in all directions and they also sent up fairy lights which at times lit up the barracks surrounding as to the right as bright as, noon, as noonday. I remember seeing one grenade falling beside me and the spring hit me. I threw myself in between two potato drills and when the explosion occurred I and the others ran for the nearest cover which was outside the barracks garden. When we got to the cover we found that one of the hand grenades had exploded near the tube in which the petrol paraffin mixture was being pumped into the barracks and it severed it. After we left the barracks garden I found that Tommy O'Neill had got a serious shrapnel wound in the leg which completely immobilised him. When Frank Aiken saw that the hose pipe conveying the inflammable mixture into the barracks had been severed, he realised that the attempt to take the barracks and subdue the garrison was a failure. That a further exchange of fire could have lit the fact and could only cause a wastage of valuable, valuable and scarce ammunition. He gave orders calling up the attack by other sections engaged in the attack. We carried Tommy to the Sinn Féin Hall at the newry side of the village and we examined his wound which had been caused by the hand grenade splinter. Frank Aiken located the splinter and was able to extract it with his pen knife. We then applied first aid dressing and Tommy was taken across the fields and onto the Kegel Road and onto Mike. We handed him over to two members of the Mike Company who conveyed him the remainder of the journey to Father Mullins house. Because of Camilla's close proximity to Newry with its large military and police garrisons it was essential that all roads leading into Camla should be properly blocked against motor traffic to delay reinforcements. In conjunction with the attack on Camla Barracks, it was arranged to ambush any reinforcements coming from Newry on the night of the attack at the Egyptian Arch about a mi half a mile from Newry on the Camla Road. This position at the arch was so strong that it was felt that heavy casualties could be inflicted on any Crown forces passing that way on the night of the attack. Frank told me that we could go down to the Egyptian arch to give the Newry men a help. We could hear heavy firing from the direction of the arch. When we came to Frank Aiken's residence, we met Frank's sister Nano. Frank asked Nano to go to some friend's house and to stay there, but Nano refused to do so, saying she was going with them. 
Whilst we were talking to Nano, we saw a flower signal at High Street, which signalled that the Tans had succeeded in passing through the ambush position at the Egyptian Arch. On seeing the flower signal, Frank, Nano and I immediately went back up the Camla Road and across the Newry Road up to Mrs Dunn's Lonans and up the fields to the Quarter Road and down a laneway leading towards the mountains. We were not far from the road when we saw several motor tenders full of Crown forces passing in towards Camla. Later on that night, we took Nano to my mother's bungalow where she joined my sister Nally and my mother. They later evacuated the bungalow when they heard that my uncle's pub was burnt by Tans shortly after their arrival in Camla and they went to Muriel Crilly's house where they remained until morning. When the Crown forces from Newry arrived in Camla after the attack was called off, all the IRA engaged on the attack were at least a half hour gone from the vicinity of the barracks. The first thing the British forces did was to set up fire to the three houses opposite to the barracks and another house called Smith's at the end of the houses near the barracks. My uncle's pub was next set fire to and completely destroyed. On the evening of the next day, Monday, those official fire raisers came to Frank Aiken's residence and sprinkled paraffin oil in the rooms downstairs and set fire to them. This attempt was a failure as the fires only smouldered and went out. They returned later and set fire again to their premises. They had, I understand, to return a third time before their efforts showed satisfactory results. On Monday night, my mother's bungalow was set on fire and completely destroyed by tans. British military tans and special constabulary occupied positions in the village and on the roads leading to it night and day for at least a week. The account of the attack on Camilla Barracks, December the 12th, 1920, by Captain Jack McElhaw of the Camilla Company of the IRA. We remember him and his comrades with pride. As stated, Oglock William Canning died following the explosion from the grenade. At his inquest, a Crown Force witness stated that the body had been thrown off the Egyptian arch down to the main road. When asked why this happened, he said it seemed to be the quickest way to get him down at the time. Um, William Canning is buried in McGilligan, up around McGilligan in, in Derry, near Derry. Um, also, strangely enough, at, a, at, the in, at the inquest of his death, his death notice states the doctor, when he examined him, said he died of gunshot wounds. So it sort of begs the question, uh, when the heavy machine gun fire was fired up into the, the volunteers, um, obviously he had also been shot as well as injured by the grenade. John Francis O'Hare survived his wounds, but was captured and taken to a military hospital in Belfast. He was released just before his death on the 5th of October 1921, nearly a good nine months later. Peter Shields, as we know, was carried to safety, but unfortunately died Christmas Day, was buried sacredly. When John Francis O'Hare died, Peter Shields' body was exhumed, and both bodies were taken and coffins were put in the Newry Cathedral. Both were covered with the Irish tricolour and the funerals were the biggest Republican or biggest ever funeral seen in the Newry area. It's estimated something like 20,000 people attended. Several, several thousand IRA volunteers accompanied the funeral uh, with full military honours. They had rifles upturned the whole way up from Abbey Yard to the right up Chapel Street, Boat Street, Chapel Street, volunteers lined the route both sides with rifles upturned to accompany the funeral to the St Mary's Cemetery. Uh, at the graveside, other volunteers from uh, each, yeah, as the last post was sounded, fired a volley of shots over each grave. Several thousand IRA volunteers accompanied the funeral for full military honours. 
and also uh, the Red Hand War Pipes Band. Um, a large troop of Common Amon, St Coleman's Brass Band and Sinn Féin Clubs. Representatives of public bodies in the Newry area, the, Chris, the boys from Christian Brothers School, the Gaelic League, GAA, Catholic Working Men's Association Club, the AOH and the John Mitchell branch of the INF. Every facet of Newry community attended these funerals. It was the biggest Republican funeral ever seen in the area then. Uh, and people to this day, 100 years later, still remember. In the background to the Egyptian arch ambush in 1920, the political landscape across Ireland was significantly changing. From the beginning of the last century, 1900 onwards, Ireland, then under British imperialist rule, experienced a political and cultural revolution. The GEA was founded to promote Irish sport and games. Conrad na Gaelic was founded to promote Irish language, literature and cultural activities. And Sinn Féin were established as a political party to promote Irish independence. In 1916, James Connolly, leader of the Irish Citizen Army, along with Patrick Pearce and many other Republican leaders, were brutally executed by the British Army following the Easter Rising. These executions led to a huge swell of support for the Republican cause, and Sinn Féin became the dominant political party in the 1919 election. By this time, the War of Independence raged through the island of Ireland. 100 years ago, on the 12th of December 1920, Oglock William Canning was killed, and Oglock Peter Shields and John Francis O'Hare were fatally wounded following the Egyptian arch ambush. So today, it is fitting and right that we commemorate the ultimate sacrifice in 1920 by these volunteers of the Irish Republican Army. Since partition, nationalist community living in the North were subject to political, cultural and religious discrimination by a unionist establishment elite. Despite this attempt to exclude Republicans, the Irish people throughout the island of Ireland have elected Sinn Féin representatives on every single county as councillors, MLAs, MPs and TDs. Today Sinn Féin are the largest political party in Ireland. The debate for Irish unity has reached new heights and we are on the cusp of achieving our political objective of a united Ireland, which the three volunteers fought and died for at the Egyptian Arch ambush. We look to the past with respect and reverence and we look to the future with confidence and hope as we continue the work to reunite our country. Mm -hmm.